Three major institutions have supported art throughout Western culture, churches, courts, and theaters. These have been the mega patrons of Western art. We're going to spend much of this unit exploring how and why these institutions shaped music and the arts. And to do that, we'll look in detail at arguably the most famous of all artistic centers, the Grand French Palace of Versailles. This palace, a vision of its creator, King Louis XIV, contained all three institutions, church, court, and theater, under one mammoth roof. But first, let's think about where we hear music in our own times. We are surrounded by music in our modern culture, at least music produced electronically through speakers and headphones. We hear music almost everywhere today, whether we want to or not, and most of it is electronically conveyed to our ears. When we're standing in elevators, on hold during phone calls, in the bank lobby, or the cafeteria line, or maybe even booming out from the car next to us at a stoplight. These are involuntary listening experiences, and ones we often try to block out. Let's start with churches and synagogues. They are prime spots for hearing live music today, both in worship services and in special seasonal events. Schools are also a place to hear live music, from halftime shows at football games to choir concerts at Christmas. And how about clubs and restaurants? That's where a lot of people hear live music as background for conversation or for dancing. And then there's the formal concert venue, which can include anything from a traditional symphony orchestra at a very fancy hall to an open-air rock concert at a NASCAR track. Concerts can be costly, unless you're happy with the cheapest seats. The economics of live music making these days are nothing to sniff at. But it's fair to say that most music these days, as we said, is heard not at concert or live events, but delivered electronically. People are more likely to push buttons to hear music than they are to take themselves to concerts or spend years learning how to play the music for themselves. That push-button aspect of music has done more to change music than anything since the printing press. Okay, who pays for all this music, the push-button music or the live music? Well, the music we hear in an elevator or while waiting on hold on the telephone is free, unless you consider that the minimal costs of providing this music are rolled into the cost of a company doing business, kind of like the cost of ice when you buy a soda. Advertisers pay for the music we hear on radio, and the same for music on TV, unless it's a cable channel, and then we're paying for the subscription. The CD players, the iPods, the computers and cell phones, and the downloads, well, we pay for those directly out of our own pockets. With live music, some churches and synagogues have a budget to pay for singers, organists, orchestral musicians, and worship bands. School taxes support the marching bands and the school choirs, and there may be a small ticket fee. The costs of a live band at a club or restaurant are wrapped up into the food, drink, and cover costs. And concert tickets, of course, come out of our own pockets. But concert tickets usually cover only a fraction of the cost of producing music live, especially in the so-called world of classical music or of opera. So that begs the question, how was music supported in the past, especially throughout the 300 years of our study? The answer is, there are a few similarities with today, but overall it was quite different. The primary patrons of music throughout most of Western culture have been the three I named at the beginning of this unit, churches, courts, and theaters. You may not have thought of these as patrons of the arts, but they were. So let's look at them. Churches were both employers and educators of musicians. Churches needed trained people both to perform and to compose new music for the services every week. Therefore, they needed a host of choir masters, organists, and singers to perform this new music. Large churches often had schools attached to them, usually for boys only, so that they were guaranteed of having capable singers through the boys' choirs. At certain times and places in Western culture, women were barred from singing in public, in choirs or on stage. So the little boys had to sing the high lines, doing so with a beguiling purity and beauty possible only from a child's voice. 
you will hear a boys choir singing the high part on one of the selections in your listening set, a chorus from Handel's Messiah. Now these little boys, once their angelic high voices changed at puberty, would sometimes continue singing tenor or bass. But there was also a practice, especially in the 1600s and 1700s, where pre-adolescent boys underwent a surgical procedure that resulted in a permanently high voice, making them what was called castrati. That strikes us as bizarre today, but it was done routinely back then, and it plays a big part in the development of Western opera. We'll take that topic up again later. But for now, let's think about what it meant to be part of a boys' choir in those long ago times. On the one hand, it was a cherished opportunity for a non-aristocratic child to get a real education, starting with learning how to read and write, which might not have happened otherwise. That was terrific. But it was not an easy life, long and grueling daily rehearsals many services to sing every week in cold, drafty cathedrals while living, for many of the boys, in stark, regimented dormitories. Choir masters and teachers were demanding and could be cruel. When we talk about Johann Sebastian Bach, I'll tell you about a famous boys' choir he directed in Leipzig called the Thomanerchor, or the St. Thomas Choir. While Bach surely had his frustrating days managing those boys, he reportedly was not one of those choir masters who beat his boys into shape. Singers and organists were full-time professionals, part of the trade of music that was passed from generation to generation. Churches recruited musicians, especially for the top job called the Kapellmeister or Chapelmaster, and for the organist position. A highly regarded organist or Kapellmeister brought status to a given church, and for that matter, being hired by a prominent church or cathedral conferred status on the musician. That hasn't changed, actually, and it is still the case today. One other thing that hasn't changed, then as now, churches needed to hire extra musicians at Easter and at Christmas, and just like today, the budget was never big enough. These occasions offered great opportunities for commissioning new musical works, such as festive orchestral suites, even cantatas and oratorios. Now, let's turn our attention to the Palace of Versailles, where we'll discuss the two other mega-patrons of the arts, the court and the theater. First, the court. By the court, we mean the palace where the king, princes, and dukes lived, plus their entire household and visible means of support, a complete apparatus for power. In other units, we'll mention the 18th century courts of the Prussian monarch Frederick the Great and the Russian Empress Catherine the Great. But Versailles served as the archetype of Western palace ensembles. Monarchs across Europe and wealthy people around the world used Louis XIV's magnificent palace, Versailles, as the model. To get into the mood for this topic, let's set the atmosphere by listening to some music that would have gone into a French royal ear. You might recognize this. It was used as a theme song for a BBC television series called Masterpiece Theatre. <laughs> As distinctive as this rondo by French composer Jean-Joseph Moret might sound to our ears, it's actually typical of the French Baroque rondo. A rondo is a very catchy piece. It's structured by a distinctive opening that returns several times with contrasting episodes in between. Grand, sweeping, and formal, even today, this rondo has become a popular wedding processional, and it would have sounded just right back then when it was played at Versailles for it expressed in sound the absolute power of the monarch. Here's another musical sound that will set the mood for Versailles, the harpsichord. For close to two centuries, the harpsichord was the keyboard instrument sounding across Europe. But while virtually every country boasted harpsichords and harpsichord builders, probably nobody loved the harpsichord as much as the French, 
who called it the clavecin. There was a brilliance, a crispness, an elegant quality to the harpsichord, and it matched the regal atmosphere in the French courts and throughout French society. Some of the most virtuosic harpsichord music ever written came from Francois Couperin, a member of an eminent family of French musicians who served the royal court. He became organist at the Royal Chapel in Versailles and later harpsichordist for Louis XIV's chamber music. He created a new vocabulary of flashy keyboard patterns, flourishes, and ornaments, and his pieces had wonderfully descriptive titles. When we hear this elegant music, see the opulent palaces, and read descriptions of impeccable court etiquette at the court of Louis XIV, or for that matter, the court of any monarch in the 17th and 18th centuries, we begin to understand what is meant by the age of absolutism. That's an important phrase, the age of absolutism. These monarchs ruled absolutely with a complete sense of divine entitlement. That's how the world worked and almost everyone accepted it. And that's why the overthrow of the French monarchy two generations later in 1789 would prove to be such a shock. Louis XIV worked hard to become the quintessential model for absolutism. He took the identity of the Sun King as his logo. He made a decision to move his palace headquarters out of Paris and into the countryside, taking his father's hunting lodge and chateau, located 25 miles southwest of Paris, and turning it into the world's most impressive palace complex. Versailles is huge, but it's officially and charmingly still called a chateau, the French term for country house. It's anything but a hunting lodge today or a country house. It contains over 700 rooms and more than 20,000 nobles could be housed in the palace complex. The name comes from the old French word Versailles, which means place where the weeds have been pulled up. It's fun, isn't it? From this spot, Louis XIV ruled with complete power, absolutely, if you will, for 55 years. Louis XIV forced his courtiers to move to this remote countryside palace in large part because of horrible memories of court intrigues in his early childhood. From Versailles, Louis could keep a watch on political schemes and keep all of his unruly courtiers under one roof and under his own thumb. He could monitor everything that happened and he used the arts, especially dance, as an implement of daily control in his courtiers' lives. That's right, dance, an implement of control. Before we go into that, let's try to understand the role of the arts in general at Versailles. Try to imagine this situation. Pretend that the White House in Washington, D.C. has a full-time orchestra attached permanently to it. The orchestra presents concerts inside the building, out in the Rose Garden, several times a week, and some portion of the musicians are playing at virtually every event, from press conferences to bill signings. They play everything from Hail to the Chief to Beethoven symphonies to Hannah Montana songs. Pretend, too, that in the east wing of the White House is a richly decorated private chapel to be used for worship by the president, his family, staff, and invited guests. That chapel keeps a full-time choir director, organist, and choir on its payroll. Attached to the West Wing is a small but elaborately decorated theater. There, a phalanx of singers, actors, and dancers work full-time rehearsing and presenting mostly new operas, plays, and ballets for the entertainment of the president the president's extended family, the staff, and invited guests, particularly diplomats and foreign heads of state. Now, after you've imagined all of that, try to imagine two more things. First, everyone in the Washington inner circle, lawmakers, lobbyists, prominent bankers and businessmen, will fall over himself or herself to get invited to these musical and theatrical occasions because being invited and being seen is a feather in one's cap. It indicates the president's political favor. A petitioner's ideas and the petitions themselves will be more likely heard if the person is seated in the same performance as the president. 
Secondly, imagine if the prestige of the United States was defined by the overall quality of these productions and the musicians, singers, actors, and dancers. The whole world would judge this presidency based largely on how resplendent and exciting would be his concerts, church music, and theatrical productions. It's impossible to imagine that, yes? I find it difficult, too, although it certainly would change the perception of the arts in this country fast. But that's not likely to happen, is it? Yet, that's how it was with the arts for centuries at monarchs' courts all across Europe during this age of absolutism. Monarchs did everything to attract and even steal the best composers, musicians, singers, actors, dancers, conductors, stage directors, costume makers, scene painters, and on and on. These artists became the tangible symbols of power at court, along with the finest chandeliers, crystal and china, best powdered wigs, beautiful parquet floors, you name it. Was this expensive? You bet it was. Did this costly aristocratic patronage of the arts ultimately collapse upon itself? You bet it did. But it was spectacular while it lasted. And the most spectacular art in Louis XIV's court was dance. Perhaps you've seen the famous graphic of Louis XIV dressed as Apollo, the sun god. The artist is rendering the king as he danced in a theatrical production. You may recall that Louis XIV adopted the sun as his public image, both because it's a powerful symbol and because the sun was a celestial body very much in the news due to the enormous advances in astronomy. And as we've said, Louis XIV was an enthusiastic patron of the sciences. But as much as he loved science, his heart belonged even more passionately to the arts, not just for their beauty and pleasure, but because the arts were political tools in his hands. His theatrical productions, especially the Fete and the Divertissement, served as carefully orchestrated presentations of power and dynastic will. So let's go back to this graphic of Louis XIV as the Greek god of the sun. He was called God's lieutenant on earth, and despite being a devout Catholic, he was painted even as a child throwing thunderbolts with the Greek gods like Zeus and Vulcan in his service. This alliance between royalty and classical mythology was no accident. There had been a huge rise of interest in classical texts during the early 17th century, particularly in France. Many in Europe were reading these texts for the first time in translation. Painters immediately filled canvases with mythological tales as well as images from Greek and Roman history, particularly Alexander the Great. In fact, it was paintings of Alexander the Great that brought attention to a painter named Charles Le Brun, who in turn would be named first painter to the young Louis XIV. Le Brun was to become the chief decorator of the royal chateau at Versailles. The dramatic force of allegory and classical myth was widely used, particularly in theater productions, and theater productions at the court of Louis XIV were filled with dance. Dance was beautiful and stately, but more than that, it was the most potent political playing field in the king's strategic design. To that end, he established as his first royal academy the Royal Academy of Dance in 1661, the first year of his official reign. Now, let's talk about this dancing business. This time you're really going to have to use your imagination. Dance, formal court dance in rigid patterns with complex steps and intricate twists of ankle, wrist, and palm was the primary vehicle for gaining power at the Sun King's court. What, you say? Yes. Gaining power. Let's imagine that we have a president who is crazy about tennis, and everyone who wants to gain his favor has to play tennis with him and play seriously. But, of course, it's bad form to beat the president, so you better stop short of winning. Now, imagine if someone established a federal academy of tennis or a cabinet post for secretary of tennis. And then they would build a complex of tennis courts connected to the White House. Government workers would spend hours a day practicing tennis just to get ready to play in matches with the president. 
take it one step further. Imagine that a person who played tennis badly would be publicly shamed and demoted from, say, a cabinet post or an ambassadorship. That's how it was with dance at Louis XIV's court. Daily, courtiers and visitors would train with top dance masters, learning the intricate steps of formal court dance. They worked very hard to avoid a false step or faux pas. Aha, now you know where that term comes from. A false step, faux pas, could get you demoted or sent away entirely from court. A faux pas wasn't just a social mistake like picking up the wrong fork, although that could get you into trouble too. A faux pas was physical evidence that a courtier had messed up the pattern and therefore might be unreliable in other duties. Sound tough? It was tough. You can read accounts of noblemen who made a faux pas and they were almost banned from the king's company. It really got interesting when the king himself grew older and found his own dancing abilities going downhill. The composers and dance masters who taught the dances had to become very diplomatic in constructing the music and steps so as not to embarrass the king. One more thing to consider. The court of Louis XIV set the standard of fashion for the entire kingdom of France and for most of Europe, and by fashion, I don't mean just clothes. Versailles was the cradle for the entire modern fashion industry as we know it today. Shoes. You can read for hours about Louis XIV's passion for shoes. His quest to have seamless leather boots made. His insatiable appetite for flashy, heeled slippers for dancing. The predecessor of today's high heels. If you see someone wearing open back shoes called mules with a curved heel, that is a Louis XIV heel, and he's wearing that shoe in a lot of the famous paintings. Every hairdresser today owes thanks to the courtiers at Versailles who were obsessed with hair design, or should I say wig design. Even the modern umbrella was launched at his court, and that included the invention of a sleek, lightweight, completely modern version of the collapsible umbrella. It was very expensive. And it goes even further. The rapid spread of the cafe culture coffee, and pastries came from his court, plus the necessary skill to bake them all. And don't forget the invention and marketing of champagne in the 1670s, another cultural fashion straight from the era of Louis XIV. And there's one more fashion that had enormous implications in architecture, Louis XIV's obsession for mirrors. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's get to know some of the artists at Louis's court. First, Jean-Baptiste de Lully. He was Italian-born, Giovanni Battista Lully, and he made himself quite French. He is known for his marvelous French operas and his dance suites. Dance suites were a fashionable musical structure found across Europe, but they were especially elaborate in France. In your listening set, you have a dance from a suite by Lully. A suite consisted of a series of slow and fast dances. Composers like Lully wrote many such suites to accommodate the serious dancing at court. Lully's name is also linked to one of the greatest of all French writers, Molière, the official court playwright still considered to be one of the world's most fabulous playwrights. Molière skirted the edge of allowable satire, walking a tightrope between outrageous humor and humor that could have landed him in jail had Louis not been amused. His plays, even today, are brilliant and riotously funny when produced right. Plus, they hold up a non-forgiving mirror to all of the excesses he saw at court, both political and personal. Usually, Louis was amused and would let him get away with murder. These plays were much anticipated productions, and they incorporated the very newest music and dance. They still wow audiences today. The closest thing we might have to such daring would be at high-profile political banquets where politicians gather to roast someone who is being honored, or maybe late-night TV stand-up comics who make clever digs at politicians and rulers. Let's get acquainted with another composer from this period, Marc-Antoine Charpentier. He was celebrated for his sumptuous music, much of it sacred, although he was overshadowed in his lifetime by the more aggressive Lully. 
Charpentier's connection with the court began in 1683 when Louis XIV was reorganizing his system for chapel music, and he held a kind of competition. Charpentier made it through the first round, but he withdrew his name because he became ill. He ended up serving, at one point, the Dauphin, the king's son. Charpentier's works remained favored by the king, who granted him a pension. He held several jobs and was associated with Moliere's theatrical troupe. When we listen to the sound of Charpentier's sacred music, we can almost see the architectural spaces in which this music originally sounded. academic studies, you will read about the Palace of Versailles and its influence across Europe. You'll see how the palace set a pattern for luxury that would be imitated by anyone who could afford to. Perhaps Versailles' most imitated architectural feature was the glittering Hall of Mirrors, begun in 1678 when Versailles became Louis XIV's official residence. When the Treaty of Nijmegen was signed, Louis instructed his chief official painter, Charles Le Brun, to paint the king's accomplishments on the ceiling of that hall, which Le Brun did in 30 paintings framed by stucco decorations. Louis appears as a Roman emperor, a great administrator, and a victorious ruler over foreign powers. The French had already become masters at creating dazzling crystal chandeliers. All that was missing from this elaborate hall was the mirrors. Louis's enthusiasm for mirrors as glamorous interior decoration and practical amplifiers of light began in the 1660s. At that time, the mirror-making trade lay in Venice, and the biggest possible mirrors were only about 28 inches tall. The French set out to co-opt the technology in a cloak-and-dagger operation that reads like a spy novel. Ultimately, they lured a master mirror-maker to France. Ironically, Louis ordered the construction of his Hall of Mirrors just a few years before a French inventor discovered how to pour the glass for casting much larger mirrors rather than making the mirror out of blown glass. When the new pouring process was perfected, mirrors quickly grew in size and became more affordable. But the King's Hall of Mirrors still was celebrated, constructed of more than 570 panes of smaller mirrors framed together in a most elegant fashion. These mirrors were positioned so that the hall always glittered, either with the sun's rays or candlelight. The hall of mirrors would be copied and bested by European palace builders well into the future. In fact, Louis XIV's love of mirrors worked its way into the homes of his courtiers and eventually into the homes of average people. Perhaps you can even find a reflection of it, no pun intended, in your own home. If you have a large mirror above a fireplace, or in an entrance hall, or above a table at the top of a stair, then you are imitating a specific fashion that was started at the court of Louis XIV, and that's the truth. By the way, the Hall of Mirrors stayed important in European history. Perhaps that's why you might have heard of it. It was chosen as the site to sign a Treaty of Versailles that marked the end of the Franco-Prussian War in 1871 signaling the Germans' desire to humiliate further the defeated French. Then, in 1919, the Hall of Mirrors was selected again for signing another Treaty of Versailles, this one ending World War I, France's way of tossing the symbolism back into the face of the devastated Germans. Here's another architectural feature that set Versailles as a standard bearer for European luxury, the gardens, with their complex of technologically advanced fountains. The formal gardens are huge, filled with statuary, and they easily take two days to view. The hydraulic technology employed for the fountains dates back to the Roman Empire and was refined by Italian engineers across the centuries. And as they did with mirrors, the French took the Italian technology and developed it to ingenious heights, 
Versailles' system of fountains would be imitated by many monarchs, particularly at the Russian palace known as Peterhof, whose fountains rival and surpass those at Versailles. Insofar as the musical ensembles of Versailles, people even today still recreate his two concert ensembles, the 24 violins of the king, a string ensemble that played for the larger occasions, and the seven violins of the king, a select group who performed at the more intimate events, such as the levee, or rising, of the king. That's right, kings woke in public, were shaved, groomed, and dressed in public. Louis ate in public and was buttoned into his nightdress and tucked into bed at night in full view of his courtiers. And all of these events were accompanied by music. Tedious, exacting, this process was required of an absolute monarch. It was like daily theater. And then there was the actual royal theater at Versailles, the site of theatrical triumphs for Moliere and operatic triumphs for Lully. It's hard for us today to imagine just how influential the theaters were back then. Occasions for opera were gala beyond imagination. In your listening set, you have an overture to an opera by Lully. The style of music in this overture, especially the opening with its block chords, slow pulse, and dotted rhythms, da, ta da, ta da, is actually called French overture style. Lully's operas were filled with dances, and the bourrée, a quick dance in triple meter, gave dancers plenty of opportunity to show their skills. And remember, Louis XIV controlled the purse strings of all three of these artistic patrons, church, court, and theater. I hope you will be able to go to Versailles one day and spend three days there at least. One day to visit the inside of the palace and two to enjoy the immense gardens. When you do visit Versailles, you will be able to understand all of this so much more clearly. You will be able to visit the beautiful chapel where Charpentier's music sounded and if the weather isn't too humid, the Royal Theater will be open for visitors to view. You might even be able to go to a performance there. And you will see for yourself the standard of luxury that was set at Versailles and copied by all of the European monarchs, aristocrats, and wealthy people for centuries thereafter. He was indeed the Sun King, and his rays still shine today.